with that, we will have our drawing uh, this evening. And uh, so uh, I don't know, it's, Jeff, is there anything you need to tell people about that? Or, uh, uh, no, I'll drop the link in uh, towards the end of the presentation. And, and the okay. Just so yeah, you, do, you do have to register if you're interested in the uh, $25 uh, uh, HRO certificate. So uh, when Jeff drops the link in the, in the chat, I guess you can go in there and, uh, and, uh, and register for it and then the computer will do the the mix up in the draw and that's the way it works so with that i will uh ask anybody got any questions for me if not well then we'll we'll go right into our program i have a barb. question hi barb yeah um i don't know if i'm registered or not I've been trying to change my name because it says you on my screen. <laughs> uh, well, it comes up in the chat. You go in and uh, and put it. Uh, isn't that right, Jeff? You go in and I don't do it. So her name looks okay to me. Yeah. yeah okay. All right. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Okay. So with that, if there's nothing else, I will turn it over to Joe. And I guess... Joe's probably already introduced himself, but uh, uh, you can, uh, now that we are in the official meeting part, Joe, you might tell everybody a little bit about yourself and about uh, your, uh, uh, some of the articles you write and things like that. Sounds like you're very, uh, very busy. So I will mute and give it to you. And I'll remind everybody, if you're not, please mute your microphones. So we don't have uh, background and all that. So go ahead, Joe. Cheers. All right. Yeah. Muting really helps me a lot. Um, let me start off with my first slide. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it. And I think I can make this work. How about that? Um, and so you'll have to let me know if it comes up correctly. How about that? Looks good, Joe. All right, should be full screen. Um, we will start off here and say, uh, I was first licensed in 1969. Now, if you see that picture, that's the way I look at Dayton. That's the only ham fest that I wear that thing at. Uh, but that's how I'm known at Dayton. And the hat helps me get found by my friends in the crowd. They say, oh, I see Joe. <laughs> they, can, they can always spot me uh, using that. Uh, I was first licensed in 1969. My Elmer was Leo W0, get fat quick. And by the way, I can't read the chats when I'm doing this because it shows up as full screen on my machine. So I can't split out. Uh, my Elmer was Leo W0, get fat quick. And he was the founder and owner of World Radio Laboratories in Council Bluffs. And so he was the guy who started me in ham radio when I was about seven years old. Uh, I was a good friend of the family, and when they saw I had an interest in radio, they said, oh, we've got a friend that has a business for that. So uh, that's where I actually took my code class and got my novice license. I am originally from Omaha. I work there, well, this says often. It's not very often anymore. It's about less than one day a week because I'm mostly retired now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um. I live in Lincoln and I work as an IT field tech, uh, fixing computers and printers and so forth, but I am mostly retired now. Uh, ever since August of 2009 is when I uh, was first asked to uh, write for CQ Magazine. Uh, the editor says, let's, let's uh, do a couple of columns and see how it works. And you'll probably run out of material in about five or six months. That was in 2009. And I'm still going strong with the monthly kit building uh, column. Um, I'm also now the uh, 
uh, updating author for the construction techniques chapter in the ARL handbook. And I've been writing for the handbook since the 2014 edition. And we're working on a real, real big update that will come out next year, uh, the 100th anniversary of the handbook. I do take a lot of photos at ham fests and so forth and i enter my best photos every year in the state fair and i am actually in the process this week of selecting those photos printing them and matting and and setting them up to uh, be sent in for judging uh, this is the week that i usually get started on that i have about two weeks of that uh, I made my first trip to Dayton in 1975, and I've spoken there 30 times. And every year I take all those photos and I set them to music, and they are available as musical slideshows on uh, YouTube. So let's start off with the uh, kit suppliers and find out who's in and who's out in the business. Number one, uh, qrpkits.com. They have a huge variety of kits and uh, they range from very, very simple to very complex, uh, really good quality kits. QRPguys.com is more uh, of the same, uh, except they're a lot more affordable. Uh, they have some very inexpensive kits and very well designed. Uh, 4SQRP.com is the four state QRP group and their kits, uh, several of them are, uh, uh, designed by NM0S, David Kripe, who is a Collins engineer in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So you'll see a bit of Collins technology kind of in there. Um, Velleman kits are sold by Jameco and so on. Alenco, uh, uh, they're sold through these online outlets as well. Ellacraft, uh, makes uh, several kits. Uh, some of them are modular where you don't solder them and several of them that you do, they still make the K2, which is a wonderful transceiver kit, um, as well as some smaller kits like a watt meter and a pocket antenna tuner for QRP, things like that. DZ kit, now that's kind of in your neighborhood. Uh, he is there in Colorado and he makes a transceiver kit. And uh, all the surface mount stuff is already done for you on that. And that's going to be kind of a theme we're going to go through later on. MFJ makes a lot of kits under their name and the Vectronics name. Uh, Nightfire Kits is at vakits.com. And they're famous for kits that are like $15 or less. And they show up to a couple of ham fests a year. Uh, primarily, usually, well, last time they weren't in Orlando. Don't know why. But uh, they will be at Huntsville this year. QRPME.com, that is Rex, and the ME stands for Maine. And uh, he does the Rock Mite as well as the Tuna Tin kits. Uh, there's lots of Chinese suppliers. Uh, there's kind of a new Heath kit out there, but they don't make a lot right now, and they've kind of stopped for a while. And uh, there's lots of clubs like four states and so forth. So, of course, we had to say goodbye to Heathkit back in 1993 or 94. Uh, Ramsey Electronics had about a 20, 30 year run of making kits, as did Tentec, and none of those make kits anymore. So, at the beginning of putting together your kit, what you want to do is make a list of the things that you need to use or test it once it's assembled, because that's probably one of the most frustrating things when you get all the stuff soldered on the board and you can't light it up. Uh, you're definitely going to want to have a multimeter. And with Harbor Freight meters being like six bucks, I mean, there's no excuse not to have a multimeter uh, an oscilloscope if you need. Uh, very much a must uh, if you're going to be doing some serious troubleshooting and scopes don't have to be expensive. A reference receiver. One of the most frustrating things I've found when making a kit that involves a receiver is to hook it up to the outside world and hear nothing. And as we know, we can have a solar flare or the bands just plain suck and you're not going to hear any signals. So it's good to have a known radio. I use an FT817 on my bench. I flip a coax switch over to it and I say, oh, okay, 
Uh, I'm not hearing anything on that either. And I flip the switch back to the kit I built, nothing either. So then I hook up a signal generator and make sure my receiver is working. Um, does it need a headset or a speaker, a key or a paddle? Um, and a dummy load and or a tuned antenna is a must. And the reason is, is that a lot of these kits are QRP and they have no VSWR protection at all. And so if you have the two most common problems, which is either a dead short or an open, uh, you don't want to burn out those tiny little finals. So you want to make sure that you have a dummy load that can handle the load uh, of what you're putting into it. And I generally have a 10 to 20 watt dummy load, but I also have a 300 watt dummy load and a kilowatt load that I can use on the bench. Uh, do you need 12 volts DC or AC power or does it run on batteries? Do you have a nine volt, double AA, A, triple A batteries? What do you need? So these are things that you want to get together before you start building the kit. Tuning tools, uh, please don't use uh, a metal hex key. <laughs> uh, tuning tools are inexpensive and very easy to come by and, um, uh, uh, get yourself a set of plastic tuning tools. Uh, ESD, uh, I could do a whole seminar on that, but electrostatic discharge can be a problem, especially when working with CMOS parts. Uh, 30 volts is pretty much all it takes to zap one of those things. Well, you're not going to feel 30 volts when you reach for that MOSFET so or ic so what you want to do is make sure that things are grounded and so forth and that if there's uh static and so forth you want to make sure you're using a wrist strap and and esd mats and things like that make sure your work surface is smooth so you don't lose any parts down the cracks what i do is i use a cookie sheet that has a lip around it and you can get those real cheap at walmart uh, I found a set of three for about six bucks. Works real well. And uh, uh, lets me keep all my parts from going away. A board holder, if you're dealing with a bigger board or one that has a lot more parts, you probably want a board holder to hang on to things. And either a printed manual or a laptop or tablet. And I don't really recommend a laptop anymore because of what I do for a living. I've seen what happens when those little scraps of wire end up in the keyboard area because then it just shorts out the whole laptop and you're done. A tablet like an iPad or an Android tablet works great, especially if it's got a case because that seems to block everything from getting into any possible opening. So if I'm cutting those leads and it goes flying off and it hits the screen of a tablet, it's just going to bounce off. Uh, laptop, not so. So uh, the advantage of the tablet over the printed documents is that you can pinch or stretch out and you can magnify things so you can look at it a little better. Uh, I'm fortunate in that that I fix color printers. So from time to time at work, I'm known to print kit manuals. Some neat things that you want to keep on hand. Number one is assortments of uh, standardized parts that are all sorted out, like uh, sets of common values of resistors, capacitors, diodes, and some common transistors and ICs. Uh, you can find these assortments sometimes in ham flea markets. Uh, some dealers at ham fest, uh, parts dealers sometimes have those. You can find them from Jameco or Newark or DigiKey or places online uh, that have those uh, standardized parts. Some of them even come in uh, containers that are already pre-marked and have the, the parts pre-sorted in them. And uh, it works quite well. Uh, the reason we want to have those kind of parts is there's no Radio Shack stores anymore. And there's very few electronic parts stores available. We don't have any in Lincoln or Omaha. so. Um, you can't go to Radio Shack to find a 10K resistor at 8 o'clock on Sunday evening. Uh, it just doesn't happen. So you want to have those common parts because also when you finish the kit, you might discover online that, oh, we changed that 100K resistor to 27K and such and such works better. Oh, okay. Well, you have that part so you can make that change. Same thing with capacitors and so on. 
Uh, nine volt battery snaps or battery holders are good, especially if uh, your kit doesn't have a case and needs a place to put a nine volt battery. Uh, you wanna have commonly used plugs and jacks such as quarter inch, eighth inch, two and three conductor of those, the plugs and jacks. RCA plugs and jacks, PL259s, all sorts of cables or adapters to be able to hook whatever you've got to the outside world. Uh, 12 volt coaxial power plugs and jacks. Uh, you want to make sure that you know if the center pin is positive or not. Uh, most kits are, but there are a few that are not. So be really careful. The vast majority of the kits nowadays are center pin positive and 2.1 millimeter. Uh, but you wanna make sure to check that before you ever plug it into a power source because we don't wanna let all the magic smoke out of those black plastic things. Uh, solder wick uh, is good to have on hand to help clean up some mistakes. Other desoldering tools like solder suckers and plungers and even a vacuum desoldering station would be good. And keep an uh, emery board on hand because we deal with enameled wire and we'll cover that in a little bit. Um, you want to choose your soldering iron carefully. Now this particular one, this series, uh, this one has been updated recently and now also has a couple of gooseneck alligator clips that can be used to hold your work right in front of you. And that comes off of the base of this soldering station too. So you're going to want one that fits your hand comfortably, uh, at least 15 to 30 watts or more. Uh, have it variable temperature, but you want one that is thermostatically controlled. This particular one uh, will keep it plus or minus two degrees Celsius. And I've discovered that Harbor Freight now sells one, doesn't have a digital display, and it doesn't have the automatic sleep mode or anything, but it will keep the tip a constant temperature that you set it for. And it's like $39 at Harbor Freight. And I don't have the number in front of me, but I just bought one a couple of days ago, and I'm going to be evaluating it. Uh, how do you know if it's ESD safe? Uh, simply look to see if it's got a three-pronged plug. Uh, you don't want to use one of those pencil irons that just has a two-pronged plug to solder CMOS parts because uh, there's actually AC on that tip and that could totally destroy the CMOS part. Uh, make sure that you have the ability to change tips, uh, that you can get new tips easily, uh, different sizes and so forth, because a lot of times if you're going to be dealing with uh, surface mount parts or, or very small parts, you probably want a small conical tip. Uh, I usually use a small chisel tip for most of my kit building. Uh, does it have a place to hang that uh, handpiece up and clean the tip? Uh, all built in, things like that. This particular one is around $60 and is pretty precise as to how it holds the temperature. It now has object holders and it has a solder roll holder, which is really great to keep that solder from rolling all over the place. And Xtronic USA is where it comes from. Uh, when I was first introduced to these things, I had no idea that that company is right here in Lincoln, Nebraska. And they sell through eBay and through Amazon as well as direct. And they supplied all of the soldering stations to the recent youth uh, camp at the Voice of America in Cincinnati. Uh, I contacted them and said, hey, these people are going to need a deal on a few soldering stations. And the lady there says, oh, I'll see what I can do for them. They donated the whole thing. They're great people to deal with. And they come out with new versions of this stuff all the time. I'm going to be going over there in a little bit and uh, seeing what's new. Here's some nice things to have. Number one, a variable voltage power supply uh, with meters. So you can see both the uh, current and the voltage you're supplying. Because after all, if you hook up uh, a little uh, pixie kit or something and you're drawing three amps, then something's going to be getting awful hot. Uh, frequency counter is nice to have because uh, you want to know what frequency you're, you're transmitting at or you want to check your, your local oscillators, things like that. Uh, an oscilloscope, 
uh, in ham flea markets. I was just at one last weekend. I was seeing them for well under $100 that work just fine, even in Tektronics. Uh, you can buy a scope kit as low as $23 online. Um, so kind of watch for those. Uh, once again, uh, a dummy load, I think, is is not just nice to have, it's a must. Uh, a vacuum desoldering station or tool. Um, what these are is a hollow-tipped soldering iron. Now, some of them just have a uh, vacuum bulb that you squeeze first, and then you put it over the connection, and then it sucks up the solder. It is a hollow-tipped soldering iron is basically what it is. The vacuum ones either have a trigger or a foot pedal uh, button that you uh, trigger and it sucks the solder away and clears the hole for you and makes it a lot easier to get the part out without destroying the board or the part. Um, that's for people who build kits a little more often, kind of like what I do. Uh, general coverage receiver, we talked about the reference receiver. It's great for entertainment and testing and checking the band conditions and so forth. Um, uh, it's it's an absolute must, I think, for your workbench. Uh, an AM FM clock radio is also good. Uh, you can be listening to your favorite music station for entertainment, and you'll hear those uh, IDs close to the hour, not precisely on the hour, but you're going to hear it close. And that kind of reminds you what time it is. So you can keep track of what's going on in the outside world while you're working. A random wire antenna, it's just simply a wire strung across your, your room or, or out to a tree or something is good for testing receivers. Uh, we mentioned a solder roll holder and uh, the correct kind of solder. This is my doctor's prescription for solder. What I use is 6337, which is not the normal 6040. This is what's called eutectic solder. It, it flows a lot better. It melts at just a couple of degrees uh, cooler than the 6040, uh, but it wets a lot better and it flows nicer and it's much more useful for hand soldering. I use 031 thickness or O25 thickness most often, rosin core, no clean. That way you don't have those brown splotches on the bottom of the board when you're done. If there's any uh, flux left, it's clear. And if you want to clean that off, you can use uh, like 91% or whatever alcohol and it comes right off. And you want to have something to put your parts away between sessions because the enemy of all kit builders is there they are. That's Tesla and Newton. So this product here, uh, the Tackle and Toolbox, is a Plano 1354. Now they make this in a hundred zillion different colors. If you went to a place like Michael's, you might find it in lavender and pink. If you go to uh, Bass Pro or Cabela's, it might look like this. Uh, if you go to Menards, it might be black and yellow, but it's the same thing. It's made identical, just different colors. And what it has is a nice big compartment in the top, and you have four trays that pull out, and they have movable sized bins in each tray. And so I can have as many as four kits in progress in there, and then I put the bigger parts or the instructions or case parts and, and partially assembled boards all up in the top section. And then each kit, I just put a little piece of paper in the front and so I know which one is which. And this is the tray that comes out of those. And you can, like I said, resize the compartments to about an inch and a half square all the way up to wider. Now what I do in this case is I put the parts that I use the most often closest to me, which would be the resistors and then the capacitors and so forth. And then we work our way up the hierarchy of parts. You can also use a cupcake tray or a regular tackle box. Uh, cupcake trays come in 6, 12, or 16 holes. And like I said, you put your most often used parts in the holes that are closest to you. And like I said, resistors are the most numerous and so forth. Uh, the case parts and the toroids and the plugs and jacks and knobs and stuff and the screws usually end up in the back. Now, sometimes you'll have a kit uh, 
that goes stage by stage. And the neat thing about this kind of kit is that you'll do it one stage at a time because it may have a lot of parts. It may have like over 300 parts. Well, if you mess up in the power supply section, you're never going to get the rest of the kit to work. So what they do is they have you build it stage by stage, usually the power supply and then the audio amplifier section and then uh, local oscillators and things like that. And they work their way through or sometimes it's the control logic and display and things like that so that you can see what it's doing as you add each stage to the radio. Uh, as you'll see here, I put numbers in there and they count up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and uh, so forth. <coughs> and they work their way back and forth through here. And so you can see uh, when you're done with that stage. So let's say um, uh, I finished the power supply, okay? And there might have been like six parts in that. So I do the test that they tell you because what they'll do is they're going to say, okay, stop here, hook up the power supply, and then take your meter and you got to measure it uh, from ground to these different points on the board. Uh, and if the right voltages show up on the right pins on the board, then you're good. Now you know the power supply works. Otherwise, you'd be keeping adding parts and it would be almost impossible to troubleshoot it. So in stage-by-stage -stage kits, uh, they adopt the technique of testing each stage thoroughly before you go on. That way it's easier to find the problem. So let's say you, you add an audio amp and it's got like nine parts, okay? So you added nine parts. Well, you know that before you put those in, everything was good. And let's say something doesn't work right. Well, it's much easier to figure out which of those parts is in backwards or in the wrong place or something like that uh, than it would be if you had 300 parts on the board. So if it doesn't work, you can fix it a lot quicker and before it's more difficult to find the problem. So you have a lot smaller numbers of parts that are installed at a time. And the good thing about that means that if you use the end of a stage as a breaking point and just snap that lid closed on those parts that you stored in the tackle box, uh, you have a logical stopping point. So what I do, once again, is I place the parts for each stage in their own cup in that tray. And then you want to make sure that when you're done with that stage, there should be no other parts left in that container. So make sure you have the, the test equipment that they call for, like, do you need a key or a paddle? Do you need the headset? Uh, do you need your meter, uh, signal generator? What do you need before you go on? Some kits have no sequence at all. They give you a bag of parts and a diagram, and they say, put it together. Well, what I do is I start with all the resistors first, then all the capacitors, and I kind of work my way up through the hierarchy of electronic parts. And I do diodes and transistors and ICs, and then some of the more odd parts. But you want to make sure that the documentation with that kit uh, should have a note if there's something that has to be done before another part is put on the board. Even if they don't, you want to look at the parts to make sure, oh, well, this one resistor, if I put that toroid in, it's not going to be really easy to get it, uh, get it in there uh, if the toroid is in first. So you want to make sure that you're not blocking the access of one part to mount another. And so once again, you want to make sure that the supply of each part is exhausted as you complete uh, installing them on the board. Now, what I do is I also look because some of these kits are going to have surplus parts. Um, some of the imported kits uh, from China, I hate to say it, sometimes just have random extra parts. Uh, some kits that let's say four states or some other group puts out, many times we'll have extra parts. And the reason is, is that there might be options. Like if it's for 20 meters or 30 meters or 40 meters or 80 meters, there might be different values of capacitors and chokes and resistors and things like that, depending on which bands you have selected for your options. So you wanna make sure that if there's any parts left over, there's a reason for them to be left over. 
I call this part of the uh, show the trouble with toroids. Uh, a lot of people will not build kits that have those in them uh, because they find it too difficult. Well, it really is not difficult. You got to follow the instructions really carefully. I'm going to be doing a group kit build in Cedar Rapids, uh, Iowa, coming up in a couple weeks that they're going to wind a toroid. So we're going to have toroid winding lessons there. Now, what we do is, first thing you want to do is the wire usually comes zigzag wound or wound in a loop, and you want to unwind it carefully into one length so you don't have any kinks in it. And hopefully your kit gives you directions like cut nine inches of wire, okay? So you cut nine inches of the wire so you're not dealing with six or ten feet of wire uh, that might come with that kit. Uh, otherwise, uh, it would be more difficult. Now, what we do here, if you look at this on the right, uh, you'll notice that you have the green wire and they have two turns of yellow wire. Well, this isn't just an inductor. This is a transformer. So you have a primary and a secondary. And we count the turns as they go through the middle of the donut. Now, if it doesn't quite make it all the way around, to the uh to make one full turn if it's made it through the middle that counts as a turn so you can see here that we count these in the middle of the donut so of course there's two yellow turns so we know that um uh there's only uh two turns of that particular wire. If you look at the green wire, there's a lot more turns. And so once again, I count them in the middle of the donut, not the outside, not the top, and not the bottom. And that's how we count the turns in the toroid. So the, the big bugaboo about doing toroids is not only winding them smoothly, tightly, and precisely, and evenly, but getting the insulation off enameled wire. Now, sometimes that wire is really thick and there's several ways to deal with it if it's really thick. Um, I have used a cigarette lighter on it and burned it. And then that leaves kind of a black stuff on it. But then if you take an emery board, it comes off very quickly and it's nice and golden. And then I take the soldering iron and I tin that wire before I put it on the board. Now, if it's what we call thermal ease wire, there's a whole nother technique. And what that does is it will melt the insulation and tin the wire at the same time. So what we do is we take some solder and we make a blob on the end of the soldering iron, pretty thick drop of solder. And then I hold it just below the base of that toroid and I let it sizzle there for a while. And you can see the smoke build up. So you might want to run a little fan so it doesn't get in your eyes. But what it'll do is, uh, if it's thermal ease type wire, it will melt the insulation off. And if you slowly draw the soldering iron away from the toroid, it will not only melt the insulation, but it tins that lead so that especially on a double-sided board, you're going to get a good solid physical and electrical connection on the top and the bottom of the board. Now, when you're doing this, you're going to have to turn up the heat on your soldering iron all the way because if it's at normal temperature, it's not going to be quite warm enough to melt that insulation. So once again, if you're going to do that method, I turn the heat up all the way. I take some solder. I make the blob. I put it under the toroid and I start melting it and I draw it very slowly away and you get a nice, neat, uh, clean wire that's got tinning on it, so it's really easy to put on the board and solder real nice. The main thing on toroids is take your time and enjoy it. Uh, some RF chokes look like a resistor, so you want to check their markings. Uh, you want to double check electrolytic and tantalum capacitors. Uh, make sure you got the right value and polarization because those two particular parts, if they're put in backwards, have a tendency to blow up if they're put in the wrong way. A lot of kits now use 1 8 watt resistors. Uh, they are a lot smaller. Um, and incandescent light, or what we call warm white uh, in LEDs, 
makes it very hard to determine the color code. So I use a, either a fluorescent light or a very bright white uh, or daylight type uh, LED light. And that way I can see the color codes very clearly. If you can't do that, I would use a meter. The meter doesn't lie. It's going to tell you what value that resistor is. Uh, look at your diode markings to make sure that the stripe or the indentation or uh, the arrow or whatever is correct. So you get that diode in the right way. Uh, if you're bending the leads, you got to be very careful to avoid breaking those fragile glass parts, things like glass diodes, those little tiny RF chokes, and those really small disc capacitors are really vulnerable to breakage. So let's look at this uh, kit here. It's sold as a transistor tester, but I'm gonna do the Ronco speech and say it slices, it dices, it purees. It, it checks for PNP and PN. Uh, if it's a MOSFET, or if it's a resistor, or a diode, or a thyristor, or an SCR, uh, an inductor, uh, an LED, it's going to tell you what that part is and what its value is, and even if it's good or not. Now, what it has is the one, two, three connector on the bottom. Now, what I do is I take those multicolored clip leads and I just cut three of them in half that are all different colors. And then I strip the wire and I tin that so it's nice and stiff. And so I have three different color clip leads. And I hook those up to terminals one, two, and three. And now we can hook up a resistor. Now, if you see those harbor freight meters, oh, they'll check diodes and they'll check PNP and NPN transistors, but you got to put the right pins in the right holes for that to work. In this, it doesn't matter which one is which. Uh, it will tell you which number lead is the collector base emitter. If it's PNP or if it's NPN, it'll identify if it's a MOSFET and it'll say DG and S, drain, gate, and source. Uh, some of the more sophisticated ones will put up the schematic symbol and everything and tell you which number lead is which. It'll tell you the beta gain of the transistor, uh, forward voltage drop on diodes and transistor junctions. Uh, on inductors, it'll tell you uh, the inductance and the DC resistance. On electrolytics, it'll also have more information as well. Uh, it tells you everything about that part so you can identify it. Now, if you see above the one, two, and three, it looks like surface mount parts with no surface mount parts on them. If you take a toothpick and push a surface mount part onto those, it will tell you what that part is as well. So if you've got unmarked parts, this is a great way to figure out how they are wired and what they are. Now, this is a little more sophisticated version of this, and there's a web address where you can get it. Uh, this one shows a schematic diagram, and there's even newer versions of this yet that has full color display. Uh, it has the one, two, and three, but it's on a ZIF socket. And you can still make up those three clip leads and where that transistor is straddling the one, two, and three, you can just take those three clip leads uh, and stick the tin leads in there and lock it down. And now you have the same three leads that you had on the other kit. Uh, this one is also a kit, but you do not solder it. Uh, what you have to do is figure out with no instructions, because it doesn't come with any, uh, how to mount it into the plastic case. And the thing you'll spend the most time with is peeling off the anti-scratch coatings uh, from each of the front and back of all these plastic pieces that protect them for, from being scratched or broken in shipping. Um, so that's what takes the most time with this one. And you gotta put the battery in there and make sure that you get that in before you put all the screws on because there's no easy way to get the battery in and out without taking the screws off and flipping the lid over. But as you can see, this gives you the gain. It tells you, uh, the collector base emitter, it's an NPN transistor, uh, and it has the forward voltage drop. When you push the button, it comes on, tests the part, 
And after it's been lit up for a while, then it just shuts itself off. Uh, this is a neat beginner's kit. Uh, this is a Morania. This is an AM broadcast receiver. And it's based on the old boys' radios of the early 60s that had a couple of transistors, one or two. Uh, it is regenerative. Uh, you do not solder through a circuit board. Uh, the back of the front panel is where all the parts solder to. It solders two pads on that board. So if you've got a first-time kit builder, this is great because if they put a part on wrong, they don't have to desolder it. All they have to do is take that soldering iron, remelt the solder on that pad, and take the tip of the soldering iron and lift that leg of the part off the board. So it's very easy to fix your mistakes without destroying the board or the part when you're working with this kit. And the back of the uh, front panel has all the parts diagrams on it so that almost without the instructions, you can pretty well figure out where all the parts go. Uh, this is another kit I like to do for first time kit builders. Uh, this particular one takes up to 30 volts uh, raw AC or uh, DC on the input. It goes through a full wave bridge and then it goes through three filters string stages and a regulator, and you can adjust the output voltage roughly anywhere from about, uh, if you're using a laptop supply, which is what I did, uh, uh, it will give you anything from about 17 volts down to 1.5 volts at one and a half amps. Now I say, well, that's not too much, but actually a lot of those little QRP kits will work just fine on it. Um, and like I said, there's a lot you can customize on this. Uh, that 5K uh, pot that's in the upper right of the board, well, you can unsolder that. And you can take those three leads and take a full-size 5K pot and put it on the front panel of a box. And you can see there's six holes here, so you got lots of options to mount it. You can take an inexpensive digital or analog meter to watch your output voltage. Now, you'll notice on the left, uh, there's no polarization marks because it's going through that full wave bridge. It can be AC or DC. Now, what I use there is a 19.6 volt laptop power supply. I am very fortunate that I've trained the guys well at work that when they scrap a customer's old laptop, that they do not throw away the power supply. They put it in a box that I cannot lift right now because during the pandemic, a lot of people upgraded their laptops. And so what I do is when I do this as a group kit build, I give everybody a laptop supply. And what I do is I cut off the plug at the end of the lead. And then I strip back the wires and I tin it. And so now they've got that 19.6 DC coming in. But we don't care which way that goes because it's going through the full wave bridge. Um, laptop supplies can, can handle a lot of current. They're very rugged. Uh, the problem is, is that because they're a noisy switcher, they're awful for use with radios. And of course, they're the wrong voltage. But with this, you clean it up real nice. And of course, the DC output on the right does have your plus and minus connections. This is a CW transceiver kit, and this was designed by NM0S in Cedar Rapids. Uh, you'll notice... It's very simple. A lot of people liken this to the uh, um, Pixie type kits uh, of super simple uh, CW transceiver fame, except for one thing. This thing actually has a receiver that really, really works. And in fact, I was able to receive things like W1AW code practice on it. And it was, it was, Kind of weak, but it was okay. It was easily copied. And then I took my KX2 and hooked it to the same antenna. And it was about an S1 or S2. So I thought, oh, well, this has really got a good receiver. Uh, you can change frequencies by just plugging in a different crystal within the same ham band that this is designed for. And if you'll notice L1 and L2 and L3, normally those would be toroids. But guess what? You don't have to wind them because they are spiral wound and etched on the circuit board itself. So you don't have to wind the inductors. Uh, it just takes up a little more space on the board. But think of that when you're doing a group kit build. 
uh, you don't have to wind the toroids. Now you'll notice it's got a single nine volt battery. Most all of these are plus or minus a couple of hundredths of a watt from exactly one watt out. And you can see the straight key is provided as part of the kit. And that's made from circuit board material. So all you got is a uh, nine volt battery on it. You hook your antenna up to it and you plug your headset in and you can tap the key and make CW contacts. It's a blast. And I've made a lot of contacts with one of these. Uh, this is another four state kit. Uh, this is the first one that is uh, a voice type thing instead of CW or data modes. And uh, this is a synthesized 75 meter AM transceiver. Really, really sweet little kit. And uh, uh, it also covers from 3.5 to a little over 6 megs so that you can listen to some international shortwave broadcast on it as well. And this is a hybrid kit. Now, uh, that topic has come up a lot, and I will be showing you some hybrid kits in a little bit. Uh, hybrid kit means it's got a lot of surface mount parts in it, but guess what? You don't have to put them in because, as you can see, look at all those surface mount parts. The through hole parts, like on that little green board, and the toroids, and the transistors, and uh, the filters, and the pots, and stuff like that, and the wires, uh, plugs and jacks and switches and things like that. You're going to put those in, uh, but the surface mount parts are already done for you and the board is already tested. So the beauty of this kit is it's pretty sophisticated, pretty complicated. You still got to wind four toroids. You still got to put in about 32 parts into it but you're not putting in like 200 or 300 parts into it and you get a nice finished kit. So we like to call these hybrid kits. Uh, the surface mount parts are already done for you. Uh, only four toroids on this and uh, it puts out a nice clean AM signal. And that's what it looks like from the back. So we'll give you a few more tips. Uh, I like to say to remove the distractions, use voicemail, things like that to handle your calls. RTFM, can't emphasize that enough. It stands for read the fine manual. Yes, I've said the other word too. Uh, use a cookie sheet to keep your parts from getting away from you and to protect your surface. Uh, make sure you got those batteries or power supply ready, plugs, jacks, cables. What do you need? Uh, keep those standard spare parts on hand. It is well worth it to get sets of spare parts and sort them out. Uh, keep your soldering iron tip clean. I clean mine when I hang it up, and when I lift it out, I clean it again. Uh, once again, you want to use good lighting and magnification like a magnified work light, uh, LED or fluorescent is what I recommend for the proper color temperature and take your time and enjoy the fun. And this is what I look like at the end of sweepstakes because everybody wants Nebraska. And so let me see if I can do this and if it's going to let me out. And I think it did. How about that? So we're going to show a few things. This is that Morania radio. And uh, uh, the PC board uh, makes up the case. Little pieces of PC board that you solder. And there's screws also to hold the front and back plates on uh, are done that way. That AM uh, transceiver is also done that way. I don't know if I'll get anything or not. Government that secures it for us. The same with Hillsdale College, one of the very best. So that's your uh, local AM broadcast. Uh, I like that kit. It's it, Like I said, it's really nice for beginners. Um, this one is the QCX Mini. Uh, it has a two-line LCD display. The top one is showing you the mode and frequency and so forth. And the bottom one is copying the CW that you're listening to. I think it's really slick. Uh, this one has uh, uh, the paddle and uh, the headset jack and the power on one side. And the other side 
uh, it says PTT and CAT. Now, what that is, is push to talk and computer control. And it mimics the Kenwood, I think, 480 transceiver. Uh, so you can actually hook it up to your computer and log and stuff. And it will read this and you can command it to go to different frequencies within that band. This one is 40 meters. Very sophisticated little thing. And these are around $100, so it's not very expensive. However, it is so small that there are a lot of surface mount parts in there. And the good news is you don't have to do any of those, but you're gonna have a bunch of toroids in there. Uh, same goes for this one. This one uh, I reviewed for the August edition of CQ Magazine. Uh, this is uh, done by WA3RNC and he is in Pennsylvania. And uh, if you look at it, uh, it's got a digital display. This is also fully synthesized, very stable, uh, but it has, I don't know if you can see this or not, but it has uh, two jacks on the side, one for a key and one for a paddle. Now, a lot of these CW kits, they will read to see if there's a short between the ring and the sleeve to see if it's a straight key or a paddle. Uh, in this, this case, you can have a key and a paddle hooked up at the same time and go back and forth between them. These kits have no menus. That little Q, uh, QCX Mini that I held up earlier has got a zillion menus and lots of functions. This one has no menus, but it has a knob for the keyer speed. Uh, it has a knob to adjust continuously the transmit power, the RF gain on the receiver, and the volume control. And then it's got a nice big synthesizer control knob that is an optical synthesizer. And you can push that knob down like a button, and uh, that controls uh, the tuning steps and everything. So it's, it's a little bigger and obviously heavier than that other one. But this is two bands. This The other one was just 40 meters. This is 20 and 40. And it has RIT and all sorts of other neat little functions. Um, if you're looking to do FT8 or other digital modes like Olivia and so on, this is the kit for you. This is called the FT8 Phaser. And like the other ones, there are some surface mount parts in there, but not as many as the others. If you look to the bottom of the board there towards the middle, you will see that there's a couple of surface mount ICs in there, and you'll see some other surface mount parts, but the vast majority of parts are through hole parts. Uh, this is put out by uh, K1SWL designed it. It's Midnight Design Solutions makes this. There are only two buttons on the front, FT8 and auxiliary or alternate or whatever. Uh, it has the FT8 frequency for that band uh, pre-programmed in it. It is a synthesizer also for stability. And you can set it so the second one is like for PSK31 or uh, Olivia or FT4, which is what mine is set up for. Um, on the back, it simply has audio out and audio in, a power switch, uh, power input, and RF out. Uh, this one, I think it's about $100 to $110, including the case, if you order the case with it. Uh, it runs on Vox, so you set up your WSJT program, so it's, it's Vox, and you don't tell it what kind of a rig it is. You just leave it at none because it'll assume it's an old radio, like a Kenwood 520 or something, and all it's going to do is put out audio and uh, receive audio. So you can uh, very simply program that in your S WSJT program. You tell it it's Vox. You don't care about the radio or the control function on it because it's fixed. It's already on the frequency for FT8. And uh, a nifty kit. Uh, I chose to do the uh, heat sink modification that makes it a little more robust, and that helps a lot. Uh, I have... Oh, I have a couple other little goodies here. Who hasn't heard of putting kits in Altoid tins? Okay. This is put out by the North Fulton Amateur Radio League, and they are in Georgia, in Marietta, Georgia, I think it is. And um, it is a simple code practice oscillator. 
Um, I think they sell these for about 10 bucks. It has 10 parts to solder. That's it. So it's a great beginner's kit. It does use two coin cell batteries. Uh, it fits in the Altoids case, which doesn't come with it. And you'll notice there's a hole in the side because there's a jack that you can plug a little key in. And uh, I don't know if I can fire it up. Let me see here. And it's got a touch module up there. When you key it, it lights up the light and it makes a beep. Let me see if that's going to come through on here. And there it goes. Um, a nifty little kit. Uh, great little code oscillator. But if you want to go to the other end of the spectrum on code oscillators, this is called the Morserino 32. And this comes from Austria in Europe. And uh, this particular one, as you can see, has got a lot of parts in it. But guess what? Most of the parts are surface mount. So how many parts in this real complicated one, which sells for around $100, uh, how many parts do you think you have to solder in this? Believe it or not, 11, just 11 parts, but it costs about 100 bucks to get it and have it shipped from Europe. Uh, it also has a uh, text display on there. Uh, if you're sending a straight key or paddle into it or using the paddles that are built in, like there in the front, it's going to tell you what you're sending. So it's a great way to learn how to send and receive. It will transmit random call signs. Uh, random English words and phrases and stuff. Uh, you can hook it to a receiver and it will copy what it's getting off the air. Uh, I said there's only 11 parts, but some of them have a lot of pins. You can see the uh, logic board has a lot of pins on that. So those 11 parts might have a few more uh, uh, solder connections to do. Uh, the the USB lead here is because it runs off of uh, USB cable. So you can take any uh, one amp uh, cell phone charger that puts out to USB and that will power this kit. Uh, finally, can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Jeff's put out our drawing and we don't have, I think, uh, so if you are interested in the drawing, you need to go in uh, and uh, register go into the chat and you'll see it there and just do what it says. And how much uh, longer, what, what, how much longer are you running about? Uh, actually, I'm almost done right now. Okay, good deal. So I, I haven't registered because somebody will get mad if I win it. <laughs> um, this particular uh, kit I'm starting to put out myself. This is a 3D printed CW key. And I found out uh, the I found the design on Thingiverse, and uh, I adjusted it slightly, and uh, it works wonderful. I did retain his use of metric size parts. Uh, I went through a uh, place called Fastenal to get the screws and stuff for this, and uh, Amazon. I think I used to get the spring and two solder lugs for it and the audio cable. And uh, what I do is I print the two parts, the, uh, the base piece and the top. And then when you add in all the parts, including the audio cable, which you cut in half so you can make two keys out of it, um, uh, these things cost about 70 cents, 70 cents to make this kit up. And it's a great thing to start out a new ham or, or a, an experienced ham who never had a key for his radio to push the, the key down and tune up his rig or something. It's a super simple, adjustable straight key. And that's it. Okay, well, we'll just see if anybody has questions for you. Very interesting. So uh, either uh, un take your, your mic off and Make sure you mute when you're done, and go ahead the one at a time, please. I got one, Jerry. Uh, the overheads or the PowerPoint presentation, will that be on the DRC website, or do you want my email? I'd like a copy. Uh, I, I did not send that. Uh, it is a PowerPoint file. I don't have PDFs or anything like that yet. Um, but if you email me an address and tell me if you want it in PowerPoint or PDF form, I can send it to you. 
Okay, I can put my email address in the chat. Well, uh, I, I won't get to keep that. It's best to email it to me. And it's it's a super easy email address. I'm Joe at K0NEB.com. Joe at Moses K0, K0NEB, K0 Nebraska, NEB. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Okay, anybody else have a question for Joe? Yeah, so how do you, there's lots of different values of resistors. How do you store all your resistors? Uh, I have a, a large parts cabinet and each tray has like six to eight different values in the same tray. And uh, that way I'm not digging through a hundred different values. Instead, I'm only digging through a half a dozen or so. And uh, uh, somebody here is pulling out a parts tray that's exactly <laughs> like what I have. Thanks, Tom. And that's, that's the way to do it. That's exactly what I talk about. That's exactly the way to do it. And he may have several different values of resistors in there, and you work up from your, your 10 ohms or whatever, your low resistors, all the way up to your megs. What I did is those are all my 1 ohms. Uh, so uh -huh. now I have to look at the last band to see what the multiplier is. That's my one O's, the one ones, one twos, one threes, and it's the standard sequence of resistors. Very good. Joe Barbara has her uh, hand up. Okay, I see. You. Yeah, Joe, I got your uh, email address is Joe at K N E B, and no, what is it? No, K zero N E B. K zero N. E -B. Dot com. Dot yeah, com. if you sent it to KNEB, it's a radio station in Scotts Bluff. <laughs> who's, who's engineer, well, that. Whose engineer <laughs> is very jealous of me having this call sign. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Um, how are we doing with the drawing, Jeff? Are we close? 21 entries so far. Okay, last call to get your name in. If you want in the drawing, go to the Go to the chat and see Jeff's uh, instruction there and uh, uh, simple to do. And like Anybody I said, else? Yeah, go ahead, Joe. There's a, I'm trying uh, to enter it right now. Harbor Freight um, has a temperature controlled soldering station. It does not have digital display and it doesn't have a sleep mode, which cools the tip off. Uh, but it is well temperature controlled. And like I said, I just got one. It's, it's sitting like off to my right on the floor here. I haven't unboxed it yet because I, I will photograph unboxing and so on and, and what's in it. Uh, but if it works out well for 39 bucks, uh, it will be to me a breakthrough for kit builders to have full temperature controlled soldering station with changeable precise tips. Uh, for 39 bucks. Uh, that's that cuts out the excuses for using those nine dollar pencil irons, uh, which I don't recommend for anything but maybe PL 259s. Okay, any other uh, questions? If not, we'll do our drawing. Uh, somebody, Bob, uh, you got a question there, Bob? Yeah, Bob, you said you had a question on key. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Bob, you yeah. unmute and ask your question. Yeah, and by the way, uh, the design for this key is done by uh, a guy from Norway. And the key, uh, the two parts, that that's part of this uh the 3d printed parts you can get this on thingiverse uh thingiverse is where people share 3d objects and this particular one is thingiverse and uh for your information it is thing number 316 7343 316 on thingiverse and I'm going to put that in the chat. So 
that is uh, the part number or the thing number. And so if you put that number in the box, you'll come up with it right away. And it doesn't take long to print it. And I'm printing like 10 or 12 at a time. Okay, I don't know what happened to Bob in his question, but I don't see him there anymore. Last chance there, Bob. Unkey, ask your question. Ah, somebody found it. Doran got it. I think it was something about Heathkit. Okay. Uh, the original Heathkit is long gone, and somebody in California bought the rights to the name and so forth and some of the old intellectual property. Um, and last I knew, he made a handful of kits, including a clock and uh, an AM broadcast receiver kit and things like that, and also reproduction parts that would replace parts that had problems with certain kits like the anemometer cups and things like that from original Heath kit. But uh, from what I was hearing from people that they've tried to order those and they haven't been responsive during the pandemic. So uh, we'll have to see if they come out the, the other side of the pandemic and maybe they'll, they'll put out some more things, but the original Heath kit is gone. The new one, uh, is uh, hard to say right now. I know they made a run a few years ago, tried, and they weren't very successful. To, to my recollection, the stuff was quite, uh, it was quite expensive for what you were getting there. So, okay, last, last chance here, and then we'll do our drawing. Any last questions? I don't have a question. I have a, a comment. Uh, one thing that can be very, very exasperating, and that is if you have a problem where you have to solder a uh, chip uh, that does not work with the soldering iron because it wants to stick to your iron. What I find is if you take that board, it has to have all the plastic parts and such out of it, but just the printed circuit board. Lay your part on that and put down some solder flux. You can put a little bit of solder on the pads before you put your chip part down. And put that in a toaster oven, take it up to reflow temperature, bring it back down, and you'll find you have your solder job done. So if you run into that problem, that's a way to work it without having to tear your hair out trying to figure out how am I going to solder this little chip part down on the, on the PC board. Yeah, actually, uh, that's a good way to do it. Uh, one of my tricks is that, uh, especially if it's a surface mount IC, uh, what I will do is I'll take uh, and put a dab of solder on one of the corner pads. And then what I'll do is I'll take some tweezers and I will hold that part exactly straight and take the iron and reheat that uh, lead. And then that holds it straight. And then I go to the opposite side of the IC. And now I can solder all those leads and then I can come back to the first one and the others on that side and make them all nice and neat. So there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, I have done surface mount kits where uh, I use solder paste, where you put a little dab on each pad, and then you set the part onto those pads, and then I use a uh, uh, an embossing type heat tool that you can get like at Hobby Lobby or Michaels, and uh, it heats it up real nice to about melting point, and you'll discover that resistors and ICs and stuff, when they get heated up that way, if they're just a slight bit crooked, they will straighten themselves out due to the surface tension. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, we're going to hold here and do the drying. And I, if, uh, if you want to hang around afterwards, we'll start losing people here if we don't do that. So, uh, uh, Jeff, where are we, where are we at there? Who's the oh, lucky? I did a sword, and our winner is KB9QDG. KB9QDG. Are you still with us? Carl. Carl? Hello, Carl. Yep, I'm here. <laughs> okay, well, are you good in... Uh, let me let me make sure I got your uh, KB9... What's the rest of it? Q Delta Golf. G. QV Victor or no. Queen Delta Golf? Kilo, Bravo. Yeah, KB9Q. 
D as in dog, G. Okay. Okay. We, that's all I think I need. Are you good? And uh, Kathy's going to look on our list here, but. Uh, I emailed you his uh, email address. Okay. 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 That's good. Okay. Well, congratulations. We'll uh, mail that to you. And so uh, we'll just tell everybody thank you. And uh, thanks to you, Joe. If, if you want to hang around, if anybody wants to has more questions, well, you're. Yeah, I'll stick around for a little bit. You're sure welcome to do so. And uh, thanks uh, for your time. Very interesting presentation. And we, uh, we will get you come back again sometime. Yep. I hope to maybe come out there to Denver sometime. Okay. Well, uh, make sure you look us up. That'd be great. Okay, I'm going to leave it to you, and uh, I'll mute here and just stand by. Thanks, everybody. Joe, thank you for that presentation. I really did enjoy that. And I do enjoy your column in CQ. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, if you've ever seen the January issue this year. Yep. That that's me. That well, that's my tower. Uh, two guys on the tower hoisting up the beam, and another guy on my roof. That was <laughs> my first <laughs> of all these years. My first full cover photo, and it's my backyard, my my roof, and my tower. <laughs> and uh, that was a big project. I redid all the grounds, all the feed lines, um, put a remote coax switch in, uh, all new LMR cable, heavy duty grounding. Uh, polyphasers, uh, remote coax switch, new rotor, everything. <laughs> well, you know, with all that new equipment, you know it's going to happen. Cars have accident suck. New equipment like that is going to have lightning suck. Well, that's that's what I worry about here. Um, uh, you can do all the lightning protection you want, but if you take a direct hit, you're done. <laughs> exactly. Although, And I've had two. I've had one hit the tree and I've had one hit the street light and that did enough damage. <laughs> it blew wow. out a lot of stuff in the house, including the underground power tap. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yes. This is Nebraska. So we don't have mountains that take the hits for us. <laughs> well, we, 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 the mountains don't take the hits, but it takes a while for them to build up. So uh, you get into eastern Colorado, and trust me, they get the tornadoes and all the rest of it. Yeah, you're talking about out by um, Weld, I think, and stuff like, like that. Well, Lyman really gets it. Lyman just seems to get oh, hit yeah. in two years. <laughs> so, again, thank you very much. You bet, Tom. And I've got a, a QRP Labs. It's the uh, Whisper Transmitter. So I got a whole bunch of toroids to wind. <laughs> yeah, I've I've got a, a QCX full size that I'm working on, and I'll be writing about that soon. And I'm going to pretty much use it as a whisper beacon. I know he's hiding someplace, but Darone also I want to. Say thank you, too, for doing the live streaming of this stuff and recording and so on. That's wonderful. Thank you, Daron. Uh Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Pleasure to be able to record this and put it up on YouTube so people can view it when they're not here. And, uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, definitely love kilt building myself and uh, being able to uh, work with some basic electronics and, and try to get people introduced into that because it's, it's not too terribly difficult. Yeah. Yeah, it's... To me, it's it's part of the fun of ham radio I've enjoyed since I was a kid. And um, kit building, uh, especially now that I'm mostly retired, I, I have a little more time to do it. Um, my upcoming ham fests, um, nothing this weekend. I will be in Cedar Rapids the following weekend. And then I think... Two weeks after that is Huntsville. I will be at the big Huntsville Ham Fest. Um, I don't know. I'll find out about Cheyenne. Uh, I should ask them if they want me or not. Uh, I'm also possibly in September doing one in Fargo. 
And then in October, there's one in Omaha, as well as the one in Cheyenne. And then I'll be at St. Louis at Halloween Ham Fest on the 30th. And then uh, my normal quiet period <laughs> uh, of November and December and uh, sometimes January. And then February starts up again with Orlando and Yuma and stuff like that. And hopefully we'll have a normal year next year. Amen. Yeah, we don't have too many uh, plans for here, unfortunately, that I haven't seen. So, yeah, hopefully uh, we'll have some ham fest here going on soon. Yeah. Oh, Tom's got the, uh, that's the Alenco. Uh, that's an AM FM broadcast receiver. And what's unique about that kit is that the schematic is printed where the parts are. So you get to, uh, you know, especially for a new builder, they get to put together what a schematic looks like and what the part looks like when it's laid on that schematic. So it helps kind of reinforce uh, how to identify parts and stuff for a new builder. And uh, it's a nice little, that's the AM FM radio, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, sir. It's uh, the reason I have it is uh, I've got some folks that wanted to know how to use things like signal generators and oscilloscopes and multimeters. So uh, I'm building this up so I can then use it to show them, well, here's how you connect things. And you can also show them what the local oscillator looks like and the IF output and the detector yes. and so forth. Just a straight super hat with, the, and yeah, I can show them the AGC and all the good things of life. But yeah, uh, the reason I'm putting this together was as a, uh, as a teaching tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are really good for that. I highly recommend it. Here's another little nifty thing. Um, this is a multimeter. But if you go like this, it's a scope. Oh, wow. And these are about $80 or so. And I only get these on one of these import websites. But it's a nifty little oscilloscope uh, with the meter. What's the frequency? Uh, but... Um, Kind of a nifty little little thing to have to take. What frequency to range does it do, Joe? Oh, the scope. Um, you know, I don't know. It just says it, well, okay, right here it says 40 megahertz. So that's not too bad. I was able to, uh, uh, on the one of these uh, 40 meter kits, easily take the RF down to single cycles on the screen. But yeah, it's a 40 megahertz scope. And it's one quick way of avoiding uh, uh, putting the ground on your scope in the wrong place. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to be careful. That's um, never happened, has it? <laughs> oh, don't want to talk about that. Um, the way the shack is set up here, um, all the HF antennas except the vertical uh, go to a DX engineering remote coax switch outside. And then it, uh, some of them, some of those leads each have uh, common mode chokes on them before it goes into the switch. Coming out of the switch, there's another common mode, uh, goes through a, uh, a polyphaser. And then there are uh, two uh, ground bus bars. Uh, which each have three more polyphasers on the same lines. <laughs> and uh, um, I have a coax switch on the right for the VHF, uh, UHF stuff, so I can switch it from the 9700 to an SDR to maybe a handheld or something I have in here, uh, so I can switch back and forth. Uh, I'm putting in an identical switch on the left side so that I can switch between the 7300 and the 7610. And also to kit radios that I would put on the desk so I don't have to unplug it from the rig. Uh, I'll be able to just have a cable with a BNC on it and I just plug that right into the kits. And uh, I could even feed the kits into the SB200 if I had to. <laughs> I don't think it's enough to drive it, but you could. 
I was going to ask what the what was in the back there. It looks yeah, like it's not Heathkit colors, but yeah, that's that's a uh, uh, SB two hundred, and I uh, took some pictures before I took it all apart, and it was identified to me as coming out uh, in the series that was about nineteen sixty eight or sixty nine, which is when I got my novice license. And like I said, it has all new power supply, all new tubes. Um, it has uh, soft start and it has the newer lower voltage uh, relay. Uh, and we do not use the ALC uh, because the ALC on it uh, is direct biasing in the tubes. And so you can't really do that with the newer rigs. Uh, the newer amplifiers have a lower voltage ALC and it's not compatible. So all I do is I don't overdrive it. <laughs> That's all you can do. I If I put more than 60 watts or so into it, I'm not getting any more output. So you know where your threshold would have been for ALC. So I just don't drive it harder. And actually, a lot of people don't use ALC on the amps. They just don't drive them. especially when you're dealing with a tube type amplifier as opposed to a solid state one. Um, the solid state ones are a little more prone to problems if you overdrive them. The tubes are a lot more forgiving, but I've never had an issue because I, I don't overdrive it and uh, the tubes are just fine. I look at my, uh, my grid current and all that and it seems to be fine. And Joe, how do you handle light, lighting protection on that remote switch? Um, there is a, there's a polyphaser after the remote switch, uh, where it comes in to the house. And then there's another polyphaser, um, before it gets to the amplifier in the rig, but, uh, outside there really isn't, um, the coax switch itself is grounded. So that grounds all the shields of all those to the tower itself and about four feet above uh, the ground connections to it. And there's an extra ground bus wire on that. So um, otherwise I'd have to ground each of those before it gets to it. And everybody told me, well, you don't really need to do that. So if the, the only instance where uh, uh, the lightning is gonna take that switch out is if it is a true direct hit because most of these antennas are DC ground to begin with. So whatever lightning currents are coming down are gonna be on your shield anyways, and it's grounded at the tower. Joe, you mentioned earlier ESD. That's a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. I bet. <laughs> in, 19, in 1964, I was the first one to identify the subjectivity of bipolar devices to ESD. And that raised a lot of ire, <laughs> to say the least. Well, yeah, because people didn't think that that was a problem, but it is. That's right. The semiconductor companies refused to believe us. And the company I worked for, we were very sensitive to that. And we then realized uh, through some of the projects we had across the country that it was not unique to Denver. We thought at first it could be because of the low, uh, the low uh, humidity. But uh, we found, soon found out that Florida, uh, back in, in uh, Massachusetts, uh, they had the same problems because we actually did analysis of parts that we worked on our programs that showed it was there. And... The semiconductor companies refused to believe it. And so we required our parts before they were shipped to be wrapped in uh, aluminum foil so that they would be protected. It wasn't until, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't remember the person that contacted me, but they wanted to know why we were doing this. Nobody else was. So I explained to them what we had found. And lo and behold, shortly after that, semiconductor companies then began to realize that that was true. We, yep. had done, we had done some long-term reliability studies because a lot of the ESD manufacturers, the protective uh, companies like the uh, shielded bags, pink poly and such, they got 
a lot of attention by saying that now you have wounded the part if you don't know that it's been uh, subjected to ESD. We did life testing uh, with the 54LO4 device and showed that once it was subjected to damage, as long as it was not restressed in that area, that it would work normally. And uh, so I've been there and done that a lot. Yeah, I had to take like two days of ESD training, just ESD, uh, when I was uh, taking training at Sun Microsystems to work on servers. And we had boards that had two big handles on it, and you'd pull it out, and it's like two and a half foot or whatever, big giant boards. And they were worth like $15,000 or so each. And you had to be uh, double grounded. You had to have a wrist strap on each one. You had to have the mat on the floor and plugged into the ground bus on the um, the rack and the chassis of the the server. <laughs> uh, the, I had to follow all these different procedures and the checklists before I could pull a board. Well, that started back in 1964. And, uh, oh, now there's somebody who remembers Sun. <laughs> <laughs> And you remember what that was all about. Oh, yeah. Actually, downstairs I have uh, a couple spark stations. Really? And, and a uh, 420 and a 4500. Oh, really? That's pretty nice. Uh, I, I was at a friend's house that had an Ultra Enterprise 450 and still was using it as a file server. <laughs> an ult Ultra 450. Well, actually, we had an Ultra 450 that uh, we were using to build the images for cable boxes hmm. for the uh, for Motorola and uh, Pace cable boxes because they, they they're running Motorola 6800s or 68000s mm -hmm. rather. Yeah, is what the old ones were. That's what the and CPU. The, yeah, and the only. Uh, the only cross compiler that we could get uh, that still runs only ran on Solaris on the spark station. So it was sitting under uh, a guy's desk uh, to do the builds in case we had to do a, a new build of firmware for cable boxes. Interesting. Yeah. Um, a lot of people will say, okay, so do you know Unix? And I said, well, I was taught on Solaris before I ever learned Linux. <laughs> and so um, that's that's pretty much how I learned the, the Unix world was through Solaris. Well, unfortunately, I don't do any Solaris any longer except at home. Uh, have about a thousand... Linux boxes that I deal with, but that's a different story. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, you forgot to push the uh, uh, YouTube that you get on regularly. Oh, I'm, I'm on Ham Nation uh, about once a month. Uh, I'm on the, the Ham Nation, which was started by Bob Heil. And it's now run by Josh from Ham Radio Crash Course. So I'm on that. Uh, every once in a while, I also appear on Amateur Radio Roundtable, uh, which is W5KUB. But most often now, I'm on Ham Nation. And every once in a while, Ted Randall on WW, uh, WTWW uh, has me as a guest on Shortwave on 5085. So it keeps me busy. <laughs> and they, they like my microphone. They say, well, you sound a lot better. You don't sound like somebody halfway across the room on Zoom. And it's because I use one of these. <laughs> yeah. That's a PR40. And my spare is this. You'll love this. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. An RE20. Well, Joe, it's 2030 our time. Uh, fantastic presentation. Really appreciate your time. 2130 here. So we'll say 73s from Lincoln, Nebraska. 
and hope to see you guys sometime out there in Colorado. Thank you. Okay, Joe. Thanks again. Thanks again, Joe. All right, take care. Mm -hmm.